I'm actually here one day a week with the association, and then I work at an independent pharmacy three days a week, and then I'm at OSU teaching. So independent pharmacy is near and dear to my heart, and I think that one thing um, we really need to do in our profession is help enable women to own more pharmacies. And I think the best way to learn that you have the power and the ability to do that is to see it firsthand. That's always been what's most impactful to me as I discovered independent pharmacy and ownership. So um, the great thing about this event is we've teamed up with Cardinal. Cardinal has a woman in pharmacy initiative. And I'll just let Eden stand up for a second and introduce herself and tell you a little bit about the initiative before we get started. Hi, everyone. I'm Eden Solzer from Cardinal Health. Welcome. Thanks for having me um, here today. Um, as Ashley mentioned, we, a number of us women at Cardinal Health, who are not pharmacists but use pharmacies, um, decided that we wanted to do something to help women um, succeed in business. And what, what, are, what better way to do that than to connect owners and students and um, really just women in general who are interested in a career in pharmacy. So Ashley is a member of our board and we go around and talk to as many, um, as many women really and those who support them. It's not only women, it's certainly men who have daughters and all those great things um, in supporting women in pharmacy. So welcome and we have a few little um, giveaways for you um, on your way out if you'd like to take one. All right, so we're basically just going to handle this as a Q&A session. Um, the first thing is I'll have all the owners introduce themselves where their pharmacies are at. Um, and then from there, whatever questions you have, I also have questions prepared too, so I'll ch ch chive in if we hit a lull. But if, when you do ask a question, I'll ask that you introduce yourself and say where you're from, just to give the ladies an idea of who they're talking to. So, Hi, um, my name is Mimi Hart. I own... Park Pharmacy in the west side of Cincinnati. Um, I uh, owned it for 20 years. My father did start it uh, in 1960. Um, I also have been teaching at the University of Cincinnati for the last 20 plus years. Um, I have a daughter um, who, after a career in opera and teaching, decided to finally go into pharmacy. She's a freshman at UC now. Um, she has a, uh, my only grandson who's a four-year-old, she's now expecting, and she planned it perfectly, she's right in the middle of the summer, uh, <laughs> so she, she gets six weeks off before she starts school again, and um, she will not be looking for a job because she will be taking my place when she graduates. <laughs> Twyla Boyd, I own Charleston Pharmacy. I've owned this store for 11 years and I've had independence, uh, another independent before this, so that's been 13 years. Um, I have a son who's in the Air Force. He's a pharmacist. I really wanted him to take over my store, but the Air Force has a different idea for him. He'll be stationed someplace. Right now he's in South Dakota. Um, I have another son who used to work in my pharmacy and he always said that he would never be a pharmacist but he wants to buy my store and run it. <laughs> so he, and he owns his own business so I think he got the entrepreneur, st uh, entrepreneur spirit from uh, watching me run the store so that's kind of fun. Um, let's see, that's about all. I graduated from Ohio Northern many years ago. <laughs> I'm Laura Atkinson. Um, I'm actually a co-owner of TWC Pharmacy and Total Wellness Concepts. Kathy, my partner, couldn't be here today. She had that nasty flu bug, so she's at home sick. Um, I handle mostly the business side. Um, we originally started out as a healthcare consulting firm um, 23 years ago, and we did a lot of consulting with, with pharmacies in addition to other healthcare um, related entities and uh, we decided to expand and, and um, start up our own pharmacy. So we've had, we, we primarily our niche is in uh, the medical um, building. So we're actually here in Columbus up by the airport in a medical building uh, called Unity Health. So we have other healthcare providers that are in there that we, we fill their scripts but we also have a, um, quite an extensive external business and, and delivery. And so we've been there for the last four years, and we're looking to expand there and add a couple of other pharmacies. All right, does anyone have questions that they are burning to ask right away? I can start us off. All right, great. 
So I think it'd be really interesting for each of you to kind of share your path to ownership and, and how you decided to become an owner, what the steps were that got you there. I can go ahead and start. My, uh, my path was like uh, shoots and ladders. Um, I started out, I worked my way through pharmacy school in a hospital. When I graduated from pharmacy school, I went to another hospital. It was one of the premier hospitals in Dayton, Ohio. And I forgot to tell you, my store is south of Springfield, an hour west of I on I-70, um, way out in the country. More cows than people in my town. <laughs> they ride sheeps and lawnmowers to my pharmacy. We <laughs> have a hitching post next to the grocery store. So, I'm not joking. <laughs> But um, after I uh, worked at the hospital, I landed the premier job. I loved the place that I was working, and unfortunately, I met my husband. Darn it. And so I got married and had to move to Indiana. Uh, but when I was there, I actually worked for an independent owner who was very good. Um, but I only worked for him for a short period of time, and then I went to work for Kroger's, and I love that because it combined two of my loves, pharmacy and shopping. I love grocery shopping. <laughs> um, so then after that, we moved back to Ohio, and my husband is Ernie Boyd in the back here. And so I worked at Riverside Hospital for just a little bit, and then I went into long-term care nursing home pharmacy. I loved it. Um, I really like talking to the nurses and the patients. Um, so I have a varied background, none of which really had independent pharmacy in it. But one of our friends, he sold his uh, store to Rite Aid, and he had a non-complete clause for five years. And he said, I'm going to come to Columbus. Let's open a store together. And I'm like, I've never run an independent. I have no idea what we're doing here. He goes, oh, that's fine. I'll be your prime. I'm your primary pharmacist. You're just my backup. I'm like, okay. So I kept my job at long-term care. Ten months later, on Christmas Day, we had an elderly gentleman that lived across from us, and we had for years said, Al, if you ever sell your store, let us know. We'd love to buy it. Christmas Day, he calls and says, that's it, I'm done, I'm tired, you want to buy my store? <laughs> Four months later, we owned another pharmacy, and I became the primary pharmacist in charge, so Kent moved to the new store, I stayed at the other store, we had started from scratch, and he moved to a store that had been in existence for 20, 25 years. Uh, so quickly, I said it was baptism by fire, I learned how to run a pharmacy. But I'm a real tight wad, so I did pretty good at it. <laughs> I made my kids take out the trash instead of hiring somebody to clean. Um, so that's how I got to pharmacy, and then eventually Kent and I sold that store. He opened another store, and I bought him out, and then I own the store that I'm at now. So that's how I got to where I am. <laughs> really strange. Um, Go ahead. Well, I, when I... My father started his pharmacy in 1960, and um, when I graduated from high school, um, I was accepted um, into the musical theater program at uh, UC uh, uh, Conservatory of Music. My parents said, absolutely not, you're going to go where you can get a job. <laughs> um, so I was very strong at, at, uh, in, in school, and so I my uh, high school pharmacy or uh, chemistry professor said you really should go into pharmacy your dad's got a pharmacy you'd be really good at it you're really good with people that's what you should do so i went into pharmacy and um so when i graduated from i graduated it was a five-year program then i graduated in four years i got out i went to work for revco um, I worked for them for 10 years. I thought maybe I wanted to go into management. I went back to get my MBA. By then I'd gotten married. I had two kids. I was going to school with my MBA. Um, Revco and I had a falling out. Um, I was passed over for a promotion. And in the basement of my store, my supervisor looked me in the eye. And when I asked him why I'd been passed over, told me I didn't think you would want to run your own store because you have small children. Well, that was the gauntlet. <laughs> so, <laughs> at that point, um, my dad called me and said a friend of his wanted to move to Arizona and had a small pharmacy that was about a mile from our family store. Would I be interested? I said, hell yes, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> so, we met. I bought his store. It was in horrible shape. Um, but I saw the p potential there. I saw the potential to grow uh, the customer base. And also, it was so close to our family pharmacy, 
I saw the potential to um, mesh the pharmacies later um, because we were in the same community. So um, I was very fortunate, and I will, which we'll probably talk about later, um, Amerisource Bergen, who is still my wholesaler, lent me a hand, um, loaned me um, uh, inventory um, for the first six months, which I then um, paid off in installments. Um, I was very fortunate in that I didn't have to buy a hundred of the really expensive stuff. I would buy, you know, if I needed 30, I would buy it from my dad, you know, instead of having to have a whole bottle on the shelf, which is a, a you know, a, made a lot of sense and, and really helped me out financially. Um, the good and the bad part of that story is, three years later, um, my father had a malignant melanoma and um, had to take some time off. So we made a family decision um, to move my store a lot earlier than I had anticipated. The good part there is 90% of my customer base went with me. Um, so, and my father, because of, of all the problems he had had with Ohio Medicaid, had stopped taking Ohio Medicaid. So I looked into a program, you know, we, we, he had, didn't want to deal with computers, got a new computer system, went online, you know, were able to, re, you know, accept Medicaid again. So, um, uh, we, you know, we were able to expand all that. So, it, you know, we've, we've just been, you know, Moving on, now, there's a young man who, who came to work for us when he was 17. Um, he got his master's in French, um, went to France for a little while to teach, came back, didn't know what he wanted to do. I said, you know what, Eric, I think you'd make a great pharmacist. You have to go back to school and pay more attention. <laughs> um, you're going to have to replace some classes that you didn't do too well on. You know, um, it's going to be really tough. You know, I'm going to sit on you, um, but, you know, I think you'd make a really great pharmacist, and if you do, I'd love to have you here. And, um, and I had to ride him harder than I ever had to ride my own kids, but he did a really good job. He, uh, he graduated last year, and he works for us full-time now. Um, and now he, you know, we're, we're, now he has the computer skills that I do not have, um, you know, the technology and so you know we're he's going to be up next month to do the the, uh, the IT thing um, here um, the media social you know getting on to the social media stuff that they're having here um, and you know we're gonna we're gonna start working all, all that stuff and you know he and Sarah together my daughter will, are going to choose a new computer system you know, so we're getting, you know, the new blood in, you know, I, I see my, you know, I don't make any of the deci the decisions that are going to be coming in 10 years that are, they're going to be, I, I don't make those anymore. I let Sarah and Eric make those decisions, you know, if we're going to be using anything five to 10 years from now, those are the decisions that they're going to have to make. You now, um, and, um, you know, so I think we have, 10 years ago, I don't know what I was going to do with the store, but now I think we're in a really, really good position. So I'm really feel, feel good about it. But the nice thing about it is I brought my kids up, in the, and, and actually two of my daughters are in the performance. Well, actually, all three of them were. Now one of them followed me, but, but the other two are in the performing arts, and my youngest daughter is in musical theater, and she <laughs> is in New York City as an actress right now, so... I have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, kind of, it's kind of twofold because um, uh, uh, the stories that I started out actually um, here at OSU. I did my undergrad here in in pre law, and um, and then uh, after I graduated, I was out for a couple years, and um, I came back to school and got my master's, um, and and then did my doctoral work. Um, the master's program uh, that I went through was a combination of um, health and, and uh, business management. So we had uh, a lot of our um, classes were at the Fisher College of Business, and so we had to do all the, the finance, the accounting, uh, 
uh, the business management, the business law, all of that. Uh, and then the other side it was the, um, the health education piece, the um, public health administration piece. And then in, in my doctoral work, um, I kind of crafted a, a unique um, program uh, because when I was in my master's, um, we had, they had a program at Ohio State um, in which um, there were a couple of local businesses, um, uh, Battelle is one, um, uh, it used to be, it's called Core Materials now, it was part of Navistar, um, DCSC, uh, and Big Lots, and we managed there, we helped them design, build, and manage their on-site um, fitness and wellness um, uh, facilities. And some of those um, uh, grew and expanded to include medical clinics and some pharmacies. Um, and so I kind of started doing that and then um, uh, uh, our professor who oversaw the program had left and you know the companies are like we don't have anybody to run our facilities can you help us? So that's kind of how I got started relatively uh, early, so I was finishing up my doctoral work and, and, and also um, running facilities um, while I was finishing up um, my schoolwork. And so it kind of it then evolved into um, a, a, an ongoing business. Um, I worked for several years and, and managing uh, nationwide um, uh, insurance we helped them build and design and manage their facilities for several years. Um, we still have a lot of local clients. We, had, we kind of expanded it to nationally. We go all over the country and, and do um, uh, wellness screens, uh, lipid panel glucose, HRAs, flu shots, disease management. Um, and uh, uh, as a part of that too, we um, started consulting with um, other healthcare professionals and and developing and designing um, their facilities. Um, so we worked with um, on the pharmacy side, uh, Northside Pharmacies, which is in Zanesville, um, and then uh, some of the medicine shops here, and also Maple Leaf Pharmacy. And we were helping them in the in the management and consulting piece of that. And and um, and that's when I met my partner. Um, Kathy, who has quite a diverse background, she's the pharmacist, and so she's worked in several retail settings, um, Target, Kmart, um, uh, Medco, uh, done some um, home infusion, and uh, also at Nationwide Children's Hospital. So she had quite a diverse background uh, on the pharmacy side, and and was help, I brought her on to help consult on the pharmacy side and then we um, decided that it would be um, ideal since we're consulting with everyone else to start our own pharmacies. And so um, we did that uh, four years ago and, and uh, now we're uh, growing this existing business and we're um, adding some new uh, pharmacies as well. Great, thank you. Do you guys have any questions? Um, other than buying an existing pharmacy or having a great family connection, do you guys um, recommend um, any other way or know any other resources that would be available for someone interested in owning a pharmacy? I can talk to this one. Okay, Any, but, anyone. I don't we mind. started our, the first pharmacy that we had, um, that Mr. Zellner and I had, we started that one from scratch. Okay. And it's really hard to start a pharmacy from scratch. You can do it, because there's a lot of people that are out there that will help you. Um, right now there are programs where um, one gentleman wanted to start a pharmacy, and I think it, he had, it was no money down. He had a wholesaler that helped get him started. Was that Cardinal? Cardinal provides that service as well. Yes. If, if folks are interested um, in learning about our pharmacy transition services. Yeah, so they can do that and then I think there have, there have been a, uh, several others that you've helped get started for a minimal amount of money to get you started with a new pharmacy. Those are great opportunities. Um, then the other one, like I said, we bought an existing store. That was a lot easier. We have to go in and change a lot all your paperwork <coughs> over and make uh, different people the pharmacist in charge and get new computers and all that. Uh, but it's, it is more difficult to start, uh, start a pharmacy from scratch. 
You know, you have to do the little drawings on a cocktail napkin to say, where do you want the walls in this pharmacy? Where are you going to put a sink? You know, I have to have electrical outlets. Where? So yeah, it's, it's really detailed. Um, you can do it both ways. There are resources. And as I said, Cardinal Health is a really good resource, especially for women. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. To kind of add to that, we actually are working with Cardinal and one of the acquisitions of um, a, another independent pharmacy. So they have some great resources. Um, you also can um, look into what's called a junior partnership mm -hmm. um, in which um, you may come on uh, and, and it's something obviously that you negotiate with the owner as to you know what level of involvement and investment and then eventually you transition the, the existing owner will transition out and you will transition into the uh, pharmacy and and then you you have all the debt on your own <laughs> to assume but that that's a way to kind of transition in whereas you know especially um, if you're uh, relatively new into and, and never been to pharmacy as she said and we started them from scratch it's not the easiest thing to do uh, we were lucky in that you know obviously having an existing businesses we had some you know cash reserves that we could put into that you know but um, you know um, aside from uh, Cardinal, and I, and I believe McKesson also has a similar program. To Miami. Help with yes. Miami. Yeah. Oh, in Miami. Yeah. 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 Um, but, you know, a lot of that is you're going to be working with um, uh, either small business lending or yeah, and some traditional lending. And so, um, and both of those typically ask that you have, you know, a personal guarantee and some investment into into the business so I think you know really knowing that up front and understanding that and, and, and speaking to someone about developing a plan as how do you want to do that is is really critical um, if that's something that you're looking at doing now uh, you're starting up a pharmacy like she say you have to you're doing it from the ground up so you're doing it from the design the build out you have to also uh, put together your your budgets your getting inventory and so all of that impacts the amount of money that you're going to need to to start it up and to set aside because you have to have cash flow to be able to stay um, you know liquid so those are all the things to kind of think about and uh, you know because um, I don't come from a pharmacy background I come from the, the business side um, I, I think in one respect with I had known those things and so we had the partnership with with Kathy knowing the pharmacy side of it, um, I think it made it a little bit easier um, because there is a lot on the business side, um, you know, just putting together the, the financials and and putting together the, the beginning inventory and knowing, you know, the, the, like they were talking about the type of software, you just even the type of software you want to want and the different functions that it does. And, We've just gone through a transition. We started out with one um, pharmacy software, and it doesn't really have the capabilities that we need on the financial side. And so I've had to add some other, um, you know, accounting software, and, and add some, we added a new uh, point of sale in which I can upload that information into our existing accounting system. So things like that you might not even think about. Um, it, it's a little bit different than than. than uh, the pharmacy practice because then uh, we haven't even talked about the whole marketing and, and all of those aspects. And of course that, uh, you know, there, there's so much to learn in pharmacy school and this is the part piece you're not getting and this is the piece that I'm always pushing for. You know, you are not getting enough business. Right. You know, when you guys graduate, you could not, I mean, you can't read a financial statement. You don't know any of the ratios. You don't, you know, you, you know, it takes, I mean, I went, I did not finish my MBA because by the time I, I realized I wasn't going to need it because I was going to be owning my own pharmacy and I wasn't going to be going into administration at that point, but I had already gotten what I needed to run my own business. I could read my profit and loss statement. I could talk with my accountant. I could make sure that my accountant wasn't stealing my money. Um, you know, um, you know. I when I sat down with my my my, my 
my uh, tax guy. You know, I knew what all the you know all those figures meant. You know, um, and even just enough for you guys are going to be making a lot of money real soon. Just enough. You know, you you need to get savvy about just what you're going to do with all that money. And you just don't have enough business, financial information. And if you have any uh, elective options left that you can get your rear ends over mm -hmm. to main campus, that's what you need to be taking. I was going to say, my son was planning on opening his own pharmacy before he went into the Air Force. He has a minor in business because he was looking at that while he was in pharmacy school. So he finished his college in the allotted period of time, but sometimes he would take summer classes in business, marketing, management, and all that, so he would have this minor when he graduated. So he had a degree in pharmacy and a minor in business management. So if you can, that is very helpful. You're going to wear a lot of hats when you're an owner. <laughs> and so you have Sweep to have an understanding. the bathroom. <laughs> yes. And so you have to have an understanding. I mean, eventually, um, if you're able to grow large enough that you're able to add somebody who has that area of expertise in the business, and that, that you can kind of delegate that, that to. But, you know, uh, originally, you're going to be the one that's going to be doing that. So you have to have an understanding, like she said, of being able to understand your financials, a profit and loss, what a balance statement mean, just also managing inventory and cash flow and um, and all of those things are really important. And marketing, um, you know, Cardinal has some good um, marketing support as, as, as some of the other wholesalers do, but you're the one that's actually going to be driving that strategic plan to, to marketing to your customers. It's not like the Field of Dreams, you know, build it and they will come. <laughs> it would be nice if it was that way, wouldn't it? You have to really uh, have a strategic plan as to who you, um, your, your customer base and, and who you're going to um, uh, market to. And, and uh, we have a very unique population in where we're at. Uh, I know all of you aren't from Columbus, so you're probably not familiar with the area, but we're kind of on the edge up there by the, the airport where you have Easton, which is you know all of the retail and all of the business, but you go down a mile down the road and it's a uh, you know, very low income area. And um, the vast majority of our patients, we see a lot of um, Medicaid patients. So we do have a lot of Medicaid patients that come to the uh, providers in the building. And so one of the things that we um, realized is that we could not just sustain off of that population base alone. So we actually had to go out and actively market, create collaborative partnerships um, with, we work with free clinics, we work with federally qualified health centers, um, we work with uh, um, a, a group called Amethyst. They're, um, they're a treatment center for, for women, um, for substance abuse and, and, and abuse women. So uh, we, and we work with uh, nursing homes, we work with um, senior centers, apartment complexes. So we had to really go out there and and, and market our services and, and create these collaborative uh, networks with people. Um, and luckily, on the other side, we had, uh, from the other side of the business, I already had some uh, connections and networking. But a lot of what uh, I do and what I'm trying to kind of pass off now to, to our managers is, is getting out there and, and networking and getting to know um, people and, and, and understanding what organizations you need a part of, because your time is very valuable. You can't be a, a part of every single organization. You've got to kind of pick and choose what is going to be valuable for you. So, um, and what, what types of organizations um, will derive the best benefit from you. Um, so, those are the, some of the things that you really need to think about. And if, if you have the luxury of then being able to add someone who has the area of expertise in marketing, they can kind of go do those things for you. Uh, that's great, but you, you have to have, you know, initially an understanding, and you'll most likely be doing that yourself. That what I did for for a long time. I designed the ads, created the, uh, you know, all of the print ads, all the radio ads, all of our um, mailers, anything that was 
for the marketing and advertising I did. Um, I have some help now, I'm lucky. But, you know, when you're starting up a pharmacy, you, you want to uh, control you, the, your expenses because you need to maintain that cash flow to, to, so you can get up and, and running so then eventually have some reserves to be able to, to add some other uh, additional staff to help you out. So, I have a question. My name is Chi Chukai Perry. I'm a fourth year pharmacist. I'm a pharmacy um, intern in Ohio State University. My question is, I just realized that most of you had other experiences before starting. How, what do you tell like somebody who's just fresh from college, jumping right into owning a business? I would say probably work for another pharmacy to get some experience there. I have a friend who owns a couple of pharmacies and his son when he graduated from uh, college, he said, from pharmacy school, he said go work at some other pharmacies and get your feet wet and see how it's, it's done and then you can come back here and then we'll work it, you can work the business, we'll, we'll work it together. But he had to go get that experience. So he had some knowledge base, and maybe I right, and that's what I did too. Yeah. You know, I you know I worked for my dad in in high school and in college, and then when I graduated, I worked for a chain because you know I I felt like like that would I I needed to figure out I knew I was probably going to wind up in an independent, but I needed to find out what were the, the things that they do well, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of things they do well, mm -hmm. or else they wouldn't still be in business, but there are some things that they can improve on or else the independents wouldn't still be here. So you need to find out what that, what that correct balance is. Okay, how about if you have a partner that mm -hmm. already has the experience <laughs> and, and you start well, off working like for And that's him. fine, I mean, because that's how, I mean, Eric, who works with me, has never worked anywhere else but my pharmacy. Okay. You know, so, and I think, I mean, you know, there I've taught probably hundreds of pharmacy students. I think I'm a good teacher. I think I've taught him well. Of course, here's the, here's, here's the bad part. It's kind of like homeschooling. He only has my opinion. Now he's gone out, gone out in other rotations and he's brought back some really good ideas. But I don't know that he, if he hadn't worked for somebody else, he might not have had more other ideas, you know. But the good or bad part is that, you know, he mostly has my ideas. You know, that makes him easy to work with, but maybe if he worked with somebody else for a longer time, he'd have, you know, some, you know, but that's the pluses, that's the risk benefit you take. Yeah, I think the, the value of having a lot of different experiences is really what's going to help you be successful. Um, and two, kind of getting up, it'll give you a feel for what it is you exactly want to do. You know, do, like we're in a, a, a medical care se setting, you know, um, I know that they're out in the rural area and there's different, the, so there's they're different in, settings, yeah, there's different the area, populations so, yeah. that you're working with and there are also um, maybe different focuses that, that independent pharmacies might um, focus on. We focus more on the preventative disease management, those types of things. We also do DME, and, but a little, very little compounding. So, um, you know, getting out and having a wide uh, experience and, and learning also the business side, not just the pharmacy side is what's really But important. if you're going to do that, I would suggest you use your rotations to your best advantage. Mm -hmm. Get out there and, and, you know, get the biggest bang for your buck that you can through your rotations. Then again, like when you try to buy out a business, what are the things, the key things you try to look at, you know, before acquiring a business? Because I know someone who's really desperate to sell will surely like hide a bunch of, you know, problems they have with the business and kind of front the nice parts. And then you get in and, you know, that whatever he swept under the car carpet shows up. So how do you... Okay, well here's what you're going to do. I have several lawyers that I have in my phone that I work with and I have a couple of uh, two accountants. So 
you're going to get a nice little stable. You're going to have a good background. You're going to have a lawyer that you can work with. You're going to have a good accountant that you're going to go work with. Then you're going to go to this person and you're going to ask for their, um, you're going to look to see their last uh, tax returns for the last couple of years. And you're going to see what their book's like. You're going to go over it. And that's where your accountant and your lawyer are both going to be very helpful because they can help guide you. Um, also, you want a banker in there because you want to, you're going to be working with one. Live Oak Bank, I think, is who uh, they have a pharmacist on their board, and they are very good uh, with working with pharmacists. And so they are going to want to look at your the financials of this other pharmacy because you're going to want to see. They can't hide it. The financials are there. The government, the IRS, is, makes them down and dirty. This is what it is. Uh, so you're going to want to look at a couple of years of financials to go back and judge and see. And then you're also going to be able to say what's your average script count for a day if you know he's oh yeah i do 250 and you, you're going to be able to look at his books and he's doing 150. it's just right it's on paper it's, yeah. it's down and you also probably want to look at if they've been audited by some insurance companies in the past you'd like to look at those audits that tells you what what they're not what at least from the insurance company's perspective what they're what they've not been doing correctly and what might be a problem in the future and um, kind of tying into what she's saying um, when you're have your attorneys and your accountants working with you you the first step is you're going to create what's called a letter of intent and in that you're kind of setting the ground rules for um, I want to see X Y and Z so I want to see your financial statements. I want to see your tax uh, taxes for the last three years. I want to see your balance statement. I want to see um, uh, a monthly script count. Um, I want to see uh, a breakdown of what all your expenses are. Um, I want to be able to go and, and see the pharmacy. I want to see the phys physical space. Um, you need to know, is that person leasing that space or do they own that space? If they lease that space and, um, you know, how many years left of that lease do they have? If you're getting a loan, the bank will typically require you to have a lease through the extension of that loan. So if you have a 10-year loan and they only have two years left on their lease, you need to ha negotiate a lease that's 10 years. And they may have negotiated, their lease may not have things, you may go into the building, you may see, oh, it needs, you know, it needs to ha be remodeled or there's some things that need to be done. That's part of that negotiation process. And, and, and so those are the things that you're able to negotiate with the, with the seller. Um, you know, there's, a, there's a, a lot of other uh, techniques, I don't know if they go into in depth yeah. and some of their system yeah. there can be like performance right and there are things you like you want to take the inventory yeah. yourself and you want to pull the outdated you know you don't want to pay for anything that's outdated yeah. I mean they're just you know but but somebody a banker you know especially somebody that's familiar with transitioning pharmacies mm -hmm. can help you with all those things one mm -hmm. of the things that that Cardinal McKesson a lot of them do they'll do what's called evaluation of the pharmacy so mm -hmm. they'll they'll look at it and they based on um, other uh, comparisons of pharmacies and, and evaluate uh, the value of that pharmacy and give you a range of what they, they their perceived value of that pharmacy is and um, so that kind of helps you set a, um, an initial uh, offer and of course in this type of process it can go back and forth yeah you can offer you can start out and you can say, I offer two million, that come back and they'll have one, three million, and then it goes back and forth. So it, it's, a, it's a negotiation, and you know, it's really helpful to have, um, as they said, you know, key advisors that, that can help you um, in the negotiation process and, and, and understanding um, you know, the, the legal and accounting is, is really important so that you know, one that um, I like to do this up front in the LOI so that there's no question that everybody's on the same page going into that purchase agreement. We, I know that in order for this sale to go through, X, Y, and Z has to be done, you know, um, including an inspection of the facility. So if ha and that means like having the city inspector come in and make sure that that building is, is sound and there's no 
um, uh, repairs or you might have, uh, if you, there's certain things if you're doing remodeling, you might have to do permits. It varies from city to city. So um, those are things you want to make sure that you have a clear understanding of. And, and um, the inventory, there's different types of purchases, but the primary purchase is an asset purchase where you're purchasing the assets of uh, that company. So that includes the inventory and typically um, you will have a, before the purchase date, before you actually purchase it, there will be a final inventory that will be done. Um, and typically there's going to be a lag time between when you take over that store, so you have to have a power of attorney so that then, because they are right now, they're billing under their MPI number. That eventually has to be switched over to you, all of the billing thing. So there's a lot that needs to be done. Um, they're really just hand somebody a check and, and have yeah, a It'd be nice, though. Can <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you talk a little bit about some of the unique services that you each do in your store um, and some things that you feel you have a little bit more freedom to do because you're an independent? Um, we do. We do many sets. Um, for people that are, you know, in their homes, we deliver them to their homes. Um, uh, we do uh, med recs for people coming out of the hospital. Um, we're, we're, we're starting, um, we're, we've done it before, but now we're trying to get it in collaboration with the doctors. So when the doctors have a patient that they feel is not going to take their medication properly, they'll call us. We will send, um, either I will go or Eric will go um, to their home. Um, the doctor will send us the list he has. They'll give us their discharge seats, which are usually a mess. You know, we'll reconcile everything. We'll put it together. Um, we'll come back and, and do a, a med sheet, which has the medications, what they're used for, a picture of the medication. Um, how they take it, and then we will repackage that for it so they'll have that list at home for their uh, their uh, caregivers, their family, whatever. But that also comes each week with um, what we deliver weekly. Um, uh, we also, you know, we deliver. Um, we are now running for. I'm. I we're running a. Uh, naloxone, um, nasal spray, uh, uh, thing for, for, I, um, volunteer for a, a, um, substance, substance abuse clinic when we got involved with, with a grant that they had for, um, naloxone nasal spray for, for, uh, at-risk individuals, um, but I think the thing that I'm, that I'm most excited about right now is 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 the medi sets and the and the um, uh, med rec, at home med rec. I think that's that's a niche that we're going to find that's going to be beneficial for us and for the patients. And I think for the hospitals when we get into the ACAs, you know that, that that's going to be um, uh, work real well for everybody. You can step this up. Oh, okay. Thank you. We'll switch it up. <laughs> um, a, a couple of things that I've kind of touched on. We do a lot of clinical services. Um, we do tobacco cessation um, programs, um, both for our patients, but also um, we have uh, corporate clients that we go outside and, and do um, tobacco cessation, um, other disease management. Uh, we do diabetes. We're in the process of um, becoming accredited. Uh, to be able to bill for diabetes education. So we have a certified diabetes educator and a nutritionist, a registered dietitian who works for us. We're in the process of getting credentials, so we'll be able to bill for uh, those services and other nutritional services. We also um, have uh, licensed social workers that work for us, so we're able to bill um, uh, on the tobacco cessation side, the substance abuse side, and uh, behavioral health. Um, we're also adding on the DME side the, the diabetic uh, shoes, so we kind of create kind of a comprehensive care so they get the education piece, the shoes, and all of the other diabetic supplies we already provide. Um, 
in, a, in addition, we uh, partner with um, a couple of the free clinics. So one's a, a lung health clinic, um, and uh, they have a grant uh, that they, um, it's kind of twofold. We provide um, all of the breathing medications and nebulizers and, and, and everything of that nature. They have a mobile medical unit. They come to our facility um, once a month, and they provide free care uh, for individuals who don't have insurance. We fill all their scripts. They have some grant funds, so they provide um, the funding for the, for the scripts. Um, and uh, uh, they also have a, a unique program through there, too, that they um, also have a, a nutritional component that they also help um, with educating the patients. And they also have what's called a, a HEAT program. It's a low-income energy assistance program. Um, it's part of the medical home model as the individuals who um, um, are low income um, based on uh, the um, federal poverty guidelines, they uh, provide them with assistance for their heating and cooling and, and water. And there's uh, been studies that have shown that individuals who um, have uh, asthma or other um, uh, respiratory illnesses are exacerbated by uh, a poor environment. And so they have some funding in which um, they pro uh, they go through the, the heat uh, model. They uh, screen these people out. They also are doing a, a, a medical uh, intake assessment. So they are looking at, um, do you smoke? If they smoke, they refer them to us. We do the counseling. You know, we also provide the, the medication side. Um, you know, if they have other medical health issues and they go through either the bus or the federal uh, or their um, free clinic, they, they have a freestanding uh, free clinic as well. And then any of the prescription medications, we, we fill for them. So we deliver, um, we deliver within about a 35 mile radius. We also do a small uh, bit of mail order and um, we also do um, uh, free business uh, delivery as well. Yeah. <laughs> Some good ideas here. <laughs> and that's what you do. You feed off right. of each other. You network and you get all these ideas. Uh, we do shots. Uh, we do the flu shots and we do shingle shots. Uh, we go out to companies and we do those for their employees. And then their company uh, will usually send us one check for everybody. Um, that's been a really nice product uh, program uh, that the company would just send that check. We also go out to churches during flu season and we give shots right after church. They always feed us. Um, <laughs> we do free delivery. Ours is only a 10 mile radius. Um, as I said, most of ours is out in the country, so 10 miles is pretty far sometimes. Um, we do a lot of compounding. We do hormone replacement therapy, the bioidenticals, and we do veterinarian for dogs and cats. So we've had guinea pigs, cockatiels, um, some interesting species. So we have some unusual things that we do. Um, but those are some of the unusual things that we have, the veterinary or the compounding and the, the free delivery. And we do have like 0.1% of that we mail prescriptions out to people. It's a very small amount. Okay. Sorry, I have to. Does anyone want to ask questions? Oh, so okay. You have a question over here. Yeah. You've got raised um, hand. Besides getting our MBA, how would we go about learning the business aspect? Like, would a junior partnership be particularly beneficial? And also, how do we meet like lawyers and accountants and things like that? Like, how do we go about doing these things? Uh, that's a good one. Um, you have your husband set up the lawyers and the accountants. <laughs> 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 Resources. Now, like I told you about yeah. Live Oak Bank, that's one that's out there, yeah. a banker. There actually is a company here in uh, Columbus, they actually gave the program, what was it, three weeks ago, yeah. Sunday. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, yeah. They have, uh, they are CPAs and they do pharmacy accounts. What is it? Mm -hmm. SSNG. Yes. yes. Okay, yes. Are, yes. And they are yeah. very, very good. Um, then there are some uh, pharmacists that go on to law school. They would be very good because they have the background in both areas to be able to help you. Um, so SSNG here located in Columbus would be your accountants. Uh, Live Oak Bank would be your banker. Um, you could call the OPA and they could probably put you in the right direction yeah. for some uh, lawyers. That's what the entrepreneurial <laughs> program club, is. Club. Yeah. The entrepreneurial uh, uh, part of OPA is for. The other thing is, you know, a junior partnership is great 
but mm -hmm. the problem is you're only learning what your partner knows. Mm -hmm. um, my dad, God love him, and he still works for me at 82 years old on Sunday nights. Aww. However, you know, if I had brought the business knowledge with me, we'd still be doing it the dark ages. So, you know, you, you, that, that, that's really on you to bring with you unless you have somebody who's... Now, I have met a lot of mostly men, and I'm so thrilled to see this changing because... I was like the very first woman to own a, a, a pharmacy all by myself in the state of Ohio. Oh. You know, a bunch of, there were women who owned it like with their husbands and stuff. But like I was out there all by myself going to meetings with all men. <laughs> and, and, and I was 30 years old. I mean, you know, it was like a little intimidating. Um, but... Um, it's so nice to see, you know, and, it, and, and, I'll, and we'll all say it's a great job for women. I mean, there's a lot you give up, but there's a lot that you get. I mean, I, there, there were things I didn't get to do with my kids. But there are a lot of ways that I was able to involve my kids in what we did. I mean, my girls all grew up working in the business. You know, they could always come and hang out if, you know, they had problems, I mean, if they had problems with their homework, they could sit in the corner and do it. I mean, they, you know, so they're, they're, it's like anything else. You, you know, there, there are things that you give up to work this many hours and not take vacations and not be able to get sick because there's nobody that comes, <laughs> you can't afford anybody to come in for you. You know, but there, there's a lot you give back to, and there's something to be said for, you know, but everybody has a boss, you know? And so you say, it must be nice to be your own boss. I said, I have, like, all my patients are my boss. <laughs> you, know, you always have a boss. You're never your own boss. <laughs> uh, can I answer your question about... Um, how do you get that experience without getting an MBA? I would suggest, you know, when you're in school, like she said, go take some of the um, finance classes, some of the business management classes and marketing classes. You know, when you are um, thinking about going out and doing your rotations, you know, um, don't just focus on, on the pharmacy side. Want to get involved on the business side, ask questions. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, when you're putting together um, uh, your advisory um, board, and that's what your accountants and your lawyers are, is you know um, talk to the, the the different owners and see you know who do they use. Um, uh, we have a, a couple different law firms because not all law firms they have different specialties, mm -hmm. but one of the um, firms that we had is a, a woman on. Um, law firm and they uh, specialize in they have like an incubator for for women to help them with resources and and funding and, and other resources so things like that where there are women um, professionals who are want to help other women yeah that's that's a great resource and I'll, I'll tell you her name it's Caroline Worley and they have a, um, a, a program here where they have a couple different professionals that they've developed this women's um, uh, business resource and incubator. Um, so that's so those are some of the things that you know um, you have a, a wealth of resources and some of the existing women owners that you know are willing to and we're to help always you. willing yes. to talk to anybody because <laughs> we know what it's like. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we were out. out there all by ourselves. Yes. And, and it's it's um, uh, it's really good that you have other people to support you. And, you know, um, you know, we didn't necessarily have those types of resources, you know, growing <laughs> up, and so we kind of had to, you know, fend for ourselves and kind of uh, muddle through on our own and, and learn from our mistakes. But um, you know, um, there are a ton of resources out there now, uh, particularly for women. Um, and that can even help 
uh, with finding funding. Mm -hmm. um, and um, one of the things we've done um, for both on the pharmacy side and on the uh, healthcare side is we've gone through and become a certified um, women-owned business, a female I'm business. I'm in the middle of that. I need to talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that opens up a whole new uh, world for you too. So like if you want to bid on, uh, for example, um, we are one of, a lot of our clients are with the government. Um, a lot of the uh, government entities have bids out to provide pharmacy services. And so um, if you, you have to go through this <coughs> certification process here in the city of Columbus is you have to become a, uh, a female business enterprise, but then you have to go and you also have to register as a vendor for them and you have to jump through all these hoops. It's a little extra work, but it, it, but it really does uh, pay off in, in, in getting access to, to other business. Yeah, my question was about the the animal side of your compounding, do you have to do a certification exam or anything? You don't have to do a certification. Once you're a pharmacist, you're a pharmacist. But you do have to go to special classes. Um, we joined a special organization. I flew down to Texas several times, and I was trained in Texas through uh, bioidentical hormones. I also went back for the veterinary side. Um, I also belong to another organization that's in Tennessee. I flew down there. I'm a cer uh, was a certified fellow, or I'm a full fellow because I'm a I own my business and I do the compounding. So there's two different parts of that one, and I've been down to Tennessee a couple times and had special training there too. I would never suggest going into compounding without joining those professional organizations and going and being trained. You don't have to be certified or take a test but you need to go and become affiliated with an organization and then go to their training programs. Do you do the Wiley protocol? The um, Wiley? I'm um, going to say no because I want to know what it is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hormonal replacement? Uh, we do the bioidentical. Yeah. But uh, I've never heard of the Wiley, sorry. <laughs> I know the Texas one is the PCCA. What's the Tennessee one called? APCO. Okay. Oh, no. No, it's, uh, what is it? ACVP. ACVP. So, okay, know, American College of Veterinary yeah. Pharmacists. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a veterinary. Oh, it's veterinary. veterinary. Yeah, but they also have ACA, which is American College of Apothecaries, okay. and that's where you're, I'm the full fellow through that. So you join ACA, and then you go through ACBP. So, so how, how are you marketing those services? Are you going to the vet? I go to, to the different veterinarians, and t Tuesday was my fun day. I went to two different <laughs> veterinarians and took them cutesy little Valentine cookies. Uh -huh. And then one of our doctors that throws a lot of business our way, I took him a really cute little cookie, too. So all of their employees are like, oh, cookies! You know, nothing speaks better than a big old fat cookie with ice on <laughs> top. You know, they're like, ooh, I remember you. And I take my business card to it, and I write down everything that we do. And, you know, we have free, a free delivery. We have free mailing. We do these hormones. We also do the veterinarian side so I do the marketing too yes <laughs> <laughs> kind of piggybacking off of all of this and I'm Kate Monroe by the way I'm an ONU student um, when you decide to take on a new service whether it's compounding HRT or vet um, do you go into the community and kind of get a um, sort of response from your customers like if they're going to use that service or do you just go ahead and trial and error with it or how do you go about a new service I don't know if that's okay. a question or not. That first. I go to the training programs, and if it gets me really excited and I think that there's a need for it, I'll do it. Like the okay. next one I'm looking at is sports medicine. Okay. Because well, I went to a program, and this, this young female pharmacist was leading the program, and she has a couple of professional basketball and football teams that she works with. And I'm like, seriously? Oh, my gosh. So she was talking about the high school teams, the college teams, the professional teams. And you have to really go into that because I've already started reading some of that and I'm like, oh my golly, there's so much to learn. But if it's something that gets you excited, mm -hmm. it's like drinking the Kool-Aid. You know, I feel like I'm going to cheerleading camp every time I go to a compounding program. I come out and I'm like, woo! <laughs> I go to an OPA convention and they've got such great programs. I come out and I'm like, oh my gosh, I just love this stuff. I'm going to do all this thyroid hormone replacement stuff. And, you know, you go to these programs and they get you fired up and excited. And that's, and then I'm like, okay, I'm going to do that. Yeah. And then sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. Like, I've gone to a lot of these. So, uh, I, I have to get my certified diabetic educator. Uh, I've gone to two different programs. I have all the paperwork. I need to buckle down and get it done. 
Um, I built a clinic in my pharmacy because I'm trying to talk to a doctor to get a nurse practitioner in there to have a, a clinic in my pharmacy. I want pharmacists in Ohio to be licensed that we have a formulary that we can prescribe off of. I'm planning for 10 years, five years down the road. But, you know, I'm going to have that nurse practitioner in here now, but maybe eventually I'll be able to have a pharmacist go in there and do the, per, the prescribing. So, I don't know, what ever gets me excited. <laughs> One of the things we do uh, when we're looking at adding a new service or, or something um, internally uh, we'll look at our, our patient profile. So for example, um, with our um, diabetes program uh, and our tobacco cessation program, um, and, and we also do MTM, is we'll uh, pull the patient profile and look to see what type of medications they're on. Um, we also do um, some surveys. We, we typically will survey not only our population, but some of our uh, customer base. Some of the things we do is we go and we network, like she was saying, uh, we go to the physician's offices and we'll sit down with them and we'll talk to them about our services and they'll tell us, you know, oh, here's something that we really need, um, you know, and then that kind of, from that demand, derives that, that service. So we work with um, a couple of, uh, um, they're called like visiting physicians, doctor's office calls. They go into the homes and provide services. And so um, we actually um, met with them and, and talked to them about our services. So we all do all the delivery, but then also they found out about our, all of our other clinic services and things like that. So, so networking, it, it really um, kind of helps you know what, what the needs are out there in, in the community and with the providers. You mentioned before that you involve your kids at your pharmacy because obviously you're a mom and a business owner. i just wondering, I guess, some tips for balance um, to be a mom and a business owner at the same time. Have a great husband. <laughs> <laughs> it really that helps. helps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Your own pharmacy that's not family everybody has to buy in um, you know we're not up here to to you know pull the wool over your this is hard work you know this is you know if somebody calls in sick you're filling in you know if you know you need to have a bunch of support because you know if the kids are sick you know you you can't you can't call in sick. You gotta, you gotta be at work, you know, or else you can't unlock the door. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you don't, you don't have a district manager that you can call and say, you know, my kid's puking, I can't come in. You know, so you have to, you have to be a better planner. Um, you have to be more organized. You know, you have to have more contingencies. Um, uh, you, you know. Um, yeah, support, <laughs> support is number one, and everybody has to be, you know, before you make this decision, it, it has to be, it has to be a family decision, you know, you have to have everybody on board. I can say that when I used, when I worked at another business, pharmacy business, um, my children were very small, and they were at a daycare, and I never got out of that pharmacy on time, and Consequently, my kids were always the last one there, and I have a son who is 23 years old, and he still harbors that. It was awful because he's like, "You left me," and I'm like, "I was five minutes late." <laughs> <laughs> the daycare was closed, and the you know everybody's sitting outside just waiting for you, mom, and it was terrible. But as a pharmacy owner, I have a lot of part-time people that I can rely on. It was really nice when my sons were in high school. I could get off and go to their track meets. I drove them to a lot of track meets, or I drove them to a lot of different soccer games. I had that freedom that I was able to take that time off, because by then my pharmacies were established, and I had people that I could call in, and they could come in and work for me. Like I had a retired gentleman. He doesn't, you can't, you can't work very long because he couldn't stand on his feet. So two hours was just perfect for him. So the last two hours of my day, I would be able to get off and go to the high school and do something with my kids. That was, it worked out so nicely. 
Whereas if I would have been working for somebody else, I would have always been going, I need off like the last two hours of work or, you know, I need that day off. And it and just left. didn't, yeah, it just didn't work. You know, yeah. I traumatized my kid when he was little. Yeah. Yeah. You, have a lot, you do have a lot more flexibility. Oh, gosh, I mean, yes. you know, so you don't work in eight hour shifts, you know. So a lot of times, you know, you just need the three hours, you know, and you can get somebody to come in for that or the four hours, you know. And, and you know, there are a lot of, I, I mean, I have had, you know, a, re a retired gentleman before Eric is working for me full time now, but you know, and I still, you know, both Eric and I have to be in Columbus for OPA. So Jack's going to come and work the weekend while you know while we're both at OPA up here at OPA. But you know, he would he was great because he'll just you know come in for a couple of hours. So it's not like you have to trade an entire shift. So you know you you. You learn, you know, to get the, you know, and there are a lot of retired guys out there who, you know, they're not looking, you know, they don't want to work four days a week. They want, but you know, they they'd love to work a Saturday afternoon, you know. So there's a lot of those out there. One of the things we did over the years is we kind of compiled a list of people that um, I miss mostly Kathy had worked with. We've, so we developed a pool. We have a pool of about now about 20 pharmacists that, you know, we can call on. Like we had an incident this morning um, that, and actually it was Kathy who was supposed to be there and she was sick. And, and so, of course, I was up at 7 o'clock calling all of the pharmacists on our list to be able to find someone to, to come in last minute. So, you know, what we've done is over the years is kind of uh, accumulated names of people who would be interested to work uh, PRN and, and, um, and, and that's really helped because, you know, we, now we have 20 people we can go down the list and one of those people are, are, are going to be available. So, luckily we were able to find someone. We had to split it in two different people, but it worked. So, you know, um, you know, as you're going along, if you think about you're going to uh, start your own uh, pharmacy at some time, you know, in the back of your head, all the people that you've been working with, make sure you keep their name you down, on and, yeah, mm -hmm. and think about that and create this list so that um, that was the nice thing is that when we um, uh, were um, opening our pharmacy, we already had this list. And so... Um, that that uh, saved a lot of headaches. That's for sure. Yeah. My question is for you, Twyla. I have an interest in veterinary pharmacy, but something that scares me about it is these products can get really pricey for the patient because there is no insurance. We have a patient who comes in every month, and she pays three to four hundred dollars for her cat's seizure medications. How do you overcome the pricing? Wow, okay, everything that we compound, well, I'm going to say 99.9% .9 of the stuff that we compound is all raw material, so we have the chemicals. Those are cheaper than if you're using a, a pre-made prednisone tablet or a felbitol or something else. Um, so everything that we have is the powder. And we are really price conscious, and that's why we have one large vet clinic that just really calls us all the time because we are so price or cost effective for their, their patients. And he said, I was just in there Tuesday, you got a cookie too. <laughs> <laughs> I told, and he said, I, I always call you guys because you are so customer oriented. You spend the time with my customers telling them how to draw up their potassium bromide in a syringe or how to put it on their food, or to let, increase the height of a, a food bowl so it's easier for a larger animal. You know, different things that you can do that makes their life easier. And so it's our customer service that helps us. And we try to, if it is kind of pricey, we'll try to do a three month prescription at a time because if I only have to touch it once, instead of three different times, that decreases the cost of my, in, uh, my pharmacy tech that's making it and the pharmacists that are checking it and, you know, and all the materials coming out three different times. It saves a lot. So we will do three months at a time. If we have them on a certain medication, like we have bucket loads of dogs that are on potassium bromide, nothing is pre-made. Everything is made that day and shipped that afternoon, and they get it the next day. So it's that quick. Um, so everything is made fresh and goes right to them, but most of these products are good for six months. 
we will do a three month supply for them to save them that that extra fee every single month and our prices are really really competitive um, I don't have anything that's that expensive Delvital, is, that okay? is, is it the Delvital? Delvital? Yeah. yeah okay um, obviously I don't have anybody on that one um, actually that you said 300 at one point and I was five six hundred dollars yeah wow. my dog was on that Oh, yeah. so, that's love. It's very. So we try to work with the patient and do some uh, try to figure out what we can do to do some cost savings. Okay. How do you organize the delivery? Do you use the mail service or you deliver yourself? I have a lady who does deliveries for me every single day, Monday through Friday. Nothing on the weekend. And then we uh, used to use FedEx or UPS. Um, that wasn't working for us, and the prices were getting right. so cost prohibitive. Yeah, Actually so does a good job. We use the post office, yeah. and it gets there the next day. Yeah. It's incredible. So I feel real confident with it. But we deliver seven days a week. Mm -hmm. We have three delivery people. We have two each day of morning, and well, we don't we don't run set deliveries. We run it as because we have a huge delivery area, probably 30, mm -hmm. 35 miles. So, you know, we set them up as, as required, but, you know, we have one, one delivery person from 10 to 3 and another one from 3 to mm -hmm. finish. How do you get those people? Are they, like, out there, like, random people or, like, a company, you know? Uh, no, you don't, no. <laughs> Not a company. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you you hire them like you hire your clerks. Okay. It, you know, some of the things, the courier services are very expensive. Right. Mm -hmm. Incredibly they expensive. Don't like to use them. If you're gonna hire someone, um, you know, there's some things that you need to think about as far as liability insurance and and things. So, so you have, I assume you all have your own. Plans. <laughs> you say that. So it each up. person <laughs> needs to have um, be on your. Um, uh, automobile and commercial liability insurance. Um, they have to go through, do background checks. Right. You know, do they check we their drivers? Get a license, couple of you know those things. We we try. You know, they have to be 18, and you know, we try to use the local, you know, college. Even sometimes the insurance company will call and say, "Nope, sorry, you just <laughs> fired that one." Okay, you know, they're not insurable. They get too many accidents, right. so. Okay. I use the church secretary. She's go. my <laughs> delivery driver. <laughs> and the law, I mean, Ohio pharmacy law doesn't like have any clause about no. that. No. Oh, no. Okay. You just have to have them fingerprinted, background right. checked, and if they pass the FBI's right. checklist, exactly. they're pretty right. good for me. Yeah. Oh. We we do uh, we do drug testing okay. for our, our yeah. employees yeah, as we well. Do. So the background checks and the drug testing and. The, you know, the insurance company is going to run their, uh, um, through the Bureau of Work, uh, Bureau of, I don't know, whatever, what is it? Yeah. <laughs> no, the, um, BMV? BMV. BMV, okay. yeah. Their record to see, um, you know, what their, their driving record is. Yes. And okay. We know their mom and dad. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. And I was going to say, Pharmacist Mutual would be a great yes. insurance company to use. Yes. That's who I would yeah. also suggest Absolutely. for insurance because they know the pharmacy business and they will send out questionnaires and they, you know, they make you pay extra for delivery drivers. So I have just one person right. who does the delivery because I don't want to pay that extra insurance on four or five of my employees. So, you know, Pharmacist Mutual is who I use as my insurance company because they know pharmacy and pharmacist. So. Do they provide all the types of insurance that a pharmacist would need, like all one one? Oh yeah, they yes. just yeah. my boat, my car, my. <laughs> and and let, let me let me let me point this out, guys. When you graduate, get individual insurance. Don't liability. Yeah. I'm lucky. Don't depend on your employer. Yeah. It doesn't cost hardly anything, and it's worth a peace of mind. Yeah, everyone should have professional liability insurance. There's a couple different. I'm lucky in that my brother owns an insurance agency, so um, I, I use them. But for um, professional liability, there's a lot of different organizations out there. HPSO, which is a good company, they're relatively inexpensive for professional liability. But everyone should have it, as she said. 
in, in some incidences, um, if uh, if you're working for someone else, and if you you're negligent, the health care company the typically walls. is not mm -hmm. going to uh, cover you. So you have to have your own professional liability insurance. What's the most challenging aspect of being known? <laughs> oh golly! I think keeping it, trying to keep everybody happy, mm -hmm. keeping all the balls up in the air. Yeah. That's a good one, yeah. Because you have to go clean the toilets, you got to run the vacuum cleaner, you got to talk to the person on the insurance company. I spent 20 minutes on the way over here. Nick was driving, and I'm talking to my wholesaler, you know, sub buying group, and I'm like, you need to check my contract again. And you know, <laughs> I don't know who all I've been on the phone with lately. Card, you know, my recycle greeting cards. Uh, talk to them. You're talking to like. Hey, from A to Z, I have a problem with a veterinary wholesaler that was giving me the runaround and double billing my my credit card and all this fun stuff. So I'm talking to wholesalers, I'm talking to a veterinary supply house, I'm talking to Pepsi, I'm working with them on something right now. You're keeping all the balls up in the air, you have to just keep it all going. Yeah. And you're the one that if the alarm goes off at 3 o'clock in the morning, that you gotta you're going to go. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, and the police will follow you with their sirens going. <laughs> You get the first law escort all the way to the store. Once they see you going 85. And actually, you always start to pull them over. Where are you going? There's an alarm at my store. I'll follow you. Yeah. Anything else? Anything else? Yeah. Anything else? Go ahead. When you're hiring new pharmacists, what's the criteria that you look at the most? Like, do you prefer new pharmacists that just graduated from um, pharmacy school or the older pharmacists with more experience? Or do you prefer background in, in pharmacy or hospital pharmacy? I just wanted to know. Well, um, how, how I do it is that we're looking at, um, at a specific need. For example, when we hired um, our most recent pharmacist, we were thinking about um, adding this diabetes education program. So we wanted someone who had, uh, who was a certified diabetes educator. So sometimes it's that, you know, whoever has that specific skill um, that you need uh, to expand your services. Um, some of it might just be, you might just need a fill-in pharmacist. And so uh, it depends on, you know, what, what your needs are at the time as to, you know, what, what you're looking for. Um, we always try to every year add a new service, and so when we're looking at uh, potential um, uh, individuals that we are looking to hire, th those are the things I have in the back of my mind. You know, I'm looking for someone with a specific skill set um, that can help us grow that that part of the business. Yeah, we, you know. We were laughing, you know, we hire somebody about once every 20 years because they don't leave unless they die. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, like when we, we hired Eric with the intent pur purpose that, you know, the, I needed somebody who knew how to do the things that are coming up, the MTM, the social media, you know, the technology. Um, you know, those types of things, and I, you know, I knew he was going to be, you know, strong, but I made him prove it. I mean, you know, he had it, and so he's been, he's been running all our MTM, and he's doing a great job. Um, so, you know, um, I think, you know, you, you're going to need to be strong in MTM coming up. Um, you know, you're going to have to be able to, to, to know the, those outcome systems as a backwards and forwards, you know, for your, you know, your next job, so. I think that's, you know, really one of the up-and-coming things you're really going to need to know how to do. And just another thing that's not skill-related, but it's kind of, I think, I mean, I don't know, a personality trait or something. But, you know, we're looking for someone who um, who is able to take initiative. Um, for example, uh, we wear many hats, so we can't really sit over someone and say, you know, if we're doing a new diabetic education program and and walk them through how to do it so there needs to be uh, you need to have that autonomy and that initiative to be able to um, even though uh, luckily the person that we hired had the, that skill set is and, and that's part of the hiring making sure the people that you hire have that skill set 
but maybe you don't have the ability to hire another person, and maybe you have someone who, uh, an existing um, employee who you want to learn this. And so you know, giving them, uh, they might have to go through some training, so you might have to send them to, to become uh, certified, uh, whether it's in diabetes education or whatever it is. So, you know, sometimes it just depends on, on where you're at and if you have those funds available to hire someone with that area of expertise or if you're going to spend the money on training an existing employee to, to take over those responsibilities. And you want to make sure that person, you know, has that um, personality where they can have that autonomy and take that initiative to be able to do that and that they're not deterred by, you know, hitting bumps in the road, you know. And aren't afraid to ask questions either when they're mm -hmm. not sure about something. Because right. when they're working for you, like, you know, when they're working at Hearts, they're the face of Hearts. They're not the face of Walgreens or CVS. And so it's, it's my store. It's more important to me, you know. And, and this is not to take away from the chains, but, you know, people see kind of, chain pharmacists is replaceable. I don't believe that. But the public perceives that, and I don't feel that way about my pharmacy, and I don't want, you know, when, when people are working in my pharmacy, they're they representing work. me personally. Mm -hmm. so. I like to look at people, I, you're all geniuses. You guys are, have to yeah. be so you much smarter than we were when we went to pharmacy education. school. education. Yes. So you have a great education. I'm not going to ask you what your grade was, but I'm going to ask you what other um, areas you were involved in in college. I want a well-rounded person. I want a, a, your left brain and I want your right brain. I want that clinical side, but I want to know that you can interact with people, that you have a creative side, that you're well-rounded. So if I have somebody that just says, I didn't do anything in college, I'm probably not going to choose them unless they're really strong in a specific area that I might be looking for. I will choose somebody that that maybe had a lower grade in college or in pharmacy school, but they are a very well-rounded person, and they know how to go out and talk to so many different types of people. And that's what I'm looking for, is somebody who can network and somebody who can get out there and be the face of my pharmacy. My, my people are all... Oh, they're wonderful. The one girl, she's been with me for probably 11 years. I brought her from my old store, and that was one of the things I put in my sale clause that she was going with me. All the others, I had to transfer to the new, uh, to the new buyer. All my other employees went with that store. I specifically put in my contract, this one was going with me. So, you know, you have to be detailed, and that was one thing I did because she was so good, and boy, I have never regretted ever taking her with me to the new store. Um, so yeah, I really look at their personality too. Um, I have one young man, not young, middle-aged guy, that works for me, and he's, he was a little, he's very smart, very knowledgeable. He was not good with customers. He didn't really have a real good personality dealing with customers. He is learning. Um, you know, we've had a few talks, and, and you know, he's like, well, yeah, that's what I said. I'm like, no, you didn't say it that way. <laughs> so, you know, he, he's evolving, and, you know, patient uh, customer service is one thing that we really dwell on at our pharmacy. We do a lot of MTM, too. Um, mainly it's, uh, well, it's the one other pharmacist and I, uh, she's really good at MTM, and I think I'm really good at MTM. I like to get out and counsel patients. Um, I actually have a whole section in a different town that an insurance company said um, the pharmacies in their area aren't taking care of these people and they have given them to me and I have them for this next year that I am standing in the gap. I am talking to them and going over all their medication with them and making sure they're taking it and know what they're using it for. And then I'm calling their doctors and I'm talking to the doctors to make sure that they know that Susie Q doesn't want to save her antidepressant before she thinks she misdiagnosed her. That was a good one. 82-year-old woman. But she <laughs> decreased her level down so low that when she went to the uh, doctor the very next week, we had talked about it, and I said, if you're on this low dose, go ahead and ask them if you can go ahead and get off of it. She talked to the doctor. I called and verified the next week, and the doctor took her off the medication because she had gone so low, and she wasn't exhibiting any signs that they thought it was okay for her. So I saved her time and money with that. So um, 
you know, customer service is real big. Even if I'm just talking to them on the phone, I have one lady who is probably in her 90s. She's uh, uh, lived through two different caregivers, three different caregivers, and she's so lonely and she has so many medication questions that I spend a lot of time with her. I don't get reimbursed for any of this, but uh, it's something that gives me satisfaction. I think that's where we're different than the chains. And, and you know, in order to really to be able to survive, um, you know, we have to be able to provide that, that personal service. But above and beyond that, I think everybody here went into independent pharmacy because they truly care about uh, their patients and, and people. Um, you know, I, I hear all these things about the personal things that you do for your patients. You know, we've all done things for our patients who so have taken them to the emergency room and brought them food. And, and you do things that the chains are not going to do. And the people remember that. The customers remember that. Um, you know, a lot of our customers, um, and then particularly Kathy who's not here, they will only talk to Kathy, you know, and, and <laughs> she knows their whole life story. And, and, and so it's, it's totally different from the chain, and, and, and it's really, um, they're more like a family, you know, and, and your staff is, 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 is your family. And, and sometimes that can be tricky, but, you know, it's, it's it definitely much more rewarding. Uh, I think, uh, you, know, um, you know, Kathy has worked in several different of the uh, chains and, and, and I hear it from a lot of other pharmacists and it's not like that. You know, you don't have that real personal um, relationship with the patients and that family uh, atmosphere both, you know, within the staff and with your patients. And so, you know, that's what makes it rewarding. Mm -hmm. you know. I think right on time. Thank you for coming and thank you all for coming. Um, I will put one little plug in for the Entrepreneurship Center. So Amy, can you stand up real quick? So Amy Wallace and I have to started to develop the Entrepreneurship Center here at OPA this year. And we're hoping to be able to provide a lot of these resources that you all have touched on today. Um, financial resources, how to have the right network around you, how you connect with wholesalers like Cardinal to be able to move forward as an owner. Who do you go to for mentorship if you're thinking about owning? So please think of OPA as someone that you can call on when these questions come up and you, you move forward. Um, I hope that this has helped inspire you all to think about independent pharmacy and potentially ownership in the future. I think it's a great area to practice in. And I think it's one of the unique areas where we can take the patient care skills that we were trained to do um, with the PharmD curriculum and actually go out and do a lot of them because you have the freedom and the initiative to be able to provide those things for your patients. So just thanks so much for coming and have a good drive and the rest of the afternoon.